Take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading to Acts chapter 10, please. Acts chapter 10. I'd like to read the first eight verses of Acts chapter 10, Acts 10 verses 1 through 8. I'll go ahead and read verse 1, then you join me on verse 2, and we'll alternate reading, so we'll end together on verse number 8 of Acts chapter 10. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's Word. And I'll begin on verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God alway. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants, and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here tonight. Lord, we would pray that once again, as we open up your word, that uh, you would minister to each of our hearts, Holy Spirit of God, that indwells every believer. Would you be our teacher this evening and help us to understand and rightly divide your word and then lord apply that word to our life please pray your blessing on the special now as it's given in jesus name amen with my whole heart i humbly seek you now use my life O lord i pray I yield my stubborn will completely. May your commandments light my way. My life, Lord, as yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mine. Rich treasures to find. Give wisdom to choice as I make along every path that I take. So when I complete my race, well done, you will say. Your word has promised me the victory. And all I need to do is claim your strength to soar with wings as eagles, to walk, to run, and not to faint. My life, Lord, is yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mine. Rich treasure to find. Give wisdom to choice as I make along every path that I take. So when I complete life's race, well done, you will say. So when I complete life's race, well done, you will say. Amen. Now, Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer and We come to open up your word tonight. 
And I ask for your help as we do that this evening, Lord. And I pray that you would help me to give me clarity of thought as we go through the Scripture this evening. And we look at the truth that you have for us tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd help the folks as they listen, that each of us would have ears to hear what your Spirit would say to each one of us this evening. Lord, I pray that our hearts and our ears and our minds would be open to what you would want to do in each one of our hearts and lives. I pray that each of us would listen carefully tonight and the word that we hear would be mixed with faith in those of us that hear it, that it would be profitable to each of us. And so control the next few moments that we have as we look into your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Acts chapter 10, we have something that is being fulfilled that Jesus had told the disciples in Acts chapter 1 when he told them, you're going to be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. They have gone from Jerusalem. Now, sadly, on part of the apostles, uh, they didn't continue to move out into Samaria or the uttermost parts of the earth until persecution came. Uh, They kind of got happy with Jerusalem and Judea. And uh, by the way, uh, we're no better than they are. Uh, The American church has become very happy just reaching America. And we're not doing a good job at that, by the way. Uh, But we've become satisfied with that. I I continually get burdened and get... um, if I'm not careful, I might even get in the flesh when I hear the missionaries that even we have and they come back with reports that, you know, well, we're building a family life center and we can't take on missionaries right now or we're building this or we're doing this and we can't take on any missionaries right now. Uh, my friend, we're missing the point. We're missing the point completely. And, and here they're, they're, they're to take the gospel with the marching orders into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Everybody is to hear the gospel. Now, they were slow in getting it done, but we're slower. There's a couple points I want to make to you, and I'm going to give you an outline here in a minute, but just in preliminary, number one, I want you to understand the gospel is for everyone. Uh, We do not believe in a limited atonement. We believe that Christ died for all. We believe God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I believe the Scripture says that that God meant what He said when He said He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I believe God meant what He said when He said He would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is God's will for everybody and everyone. When I think He said preach the gospel to every creature, I think He meant every creature. And God would desire that everybody hear the gospel. Number two, the second thing I want you to point out, I want to point out to you is that we are slow in getting that job done. Did you realize that tonight, listen carefully, that 95% of believing Christians, 95% of people who know Jesus as their Savior will never tell anyone else how they can know Jesus as their Savior. Only 5% of Bible believing Christians will ever tell someone else how they too can be saved. As a result of that, I want to tell you something. If we stopped, if we stopped all the deaths and all the births, in other words, right now we just stopped at seven point whatever billion we have on the planet. There was nobody else born and nobody else died. And we continued to win people to Christ at the same rate we're winning them now, it would take us three thousand years to win the world to Christ. The problem is, the births aren't stopping. And the deaths aren't stopping. They continue. And it's it's foolish for us, just like I get frustrated with the opioid crisis and the overdose deaths. Uh, What is it in the last uh, week or ten days? 29 deaths just in Ohio alone. It's unbelievable. And And yet, we just keep doing the same thing thinking it's going to be different. But it doesn't different, it just gets worse. But, but, but how different is the church? We see the number of lost just increasing year after year after year and unreached people groups increasing and yet we do nothing different. 
85% of our missionaries go to the same 22 countries of the world. What's wrong with all the other countries of the world? There's so many unreached people groups. I remember, in fact, I think there's over 7,000 unreached people groups in the world. I remember being in the pastor's conference in India two years ago, and of the pastors there and the students there from the student body, I think there were 18 different people groups represented just in that one conference. But how can we keep sending missionaries to the same 22 countries when there's over 7,000 different people groups that have never heard the Gospel of Jesus Christ? No wonder we're falling behind. No wonder we're not catching up. No wonder we're not getting the job done. What was very sobering would be this. I wonder, and don't, don't answer out loud or don't make any expression, but I wonder if you were... If, if I started right now, September 9th, 2018, and said, okay, between now and September 9th, 2019, I will give you $1,000 for every person you lead to faith in Jesus Christ. I wonder how many people would become soul winners. I wonder how many people would begin to tell everybody they could about Jesus. And would it... Would that reveal that I will do for the love of money what I will not do for the love of my Savior? I think that's where we are. And so we're, we're falling behind in the process. I don't want my love of money to be stronger than my love for God. Here in Acts 10, the Gospel finally will go to the uttermost parts of the earth. It will go to a Gentile. The man's name is Cornelius. He's an Italian man. And he's seeking God. And that's three, three points I'm going to give with you tonight. Number one is the man is seeking. The man is seeking. Cornelius, as we read, now verse number two, was a devout man. He feared God with all his house. He gave much alms to the people. Alms is giving to the poor. Whenever you see alms in the Bible, it's giving to those who are poor. And he prayed to God always. So here he is. He fears God. He gives much alms to the poor. And he prays to God always. Well, what's the problem? Seems like a pretty good guy. In fact, he might do more than most professing Christians do. You know what the problem is? He doesn't know Jesus Christ. He's lost. Here he is. Religious. Devout. Sincere, feared God, gave much alms, prayed to God always. How many Christians can say that? That they pray without ceasing. Not only that, his life caused others to turn to God as well. You notice that he had others in his house. He, he feared God with all his house. So he influenced others. But he was without Christ. He was lost. He was seeking. He was trying to do good. He was trying to do what he could, but he was lost. Seeking, but lost. I was reading about China 30 years ago, the number of Christians, and by the way, you, you understand when sometimes these statistics come in and they say there's this many Christians in the country that, that does not just include those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. Sometimes anyone who's not a Muslim is considered a Christian. Sometimes they will put uh, those of the Catholic faith among Christians. I'm not saying that no Catholics can be a Christian. Certainly those who trust Christ as their Savior, and there are probably those who have trusted Christ as their Savior, and are still in the Catholic Church. But if you follow Catholic doctrine and follow what the Catholic doctrine believes, you are not a born-again Christian. That's not what they teach. But they're included in those statistics. And they say uh, 30 years ago there were around 30 million, I'm sorry, 3 million Christians in China. 
Now, 30 years later, they say there's approximately 150 million Christians in China. It's hard to determine because the true believers are in what they would call unregistered or underground churches. And it's very difficult to determine the number of believers there. But God has done an amazing thing. Now, how can that happen in a country where God's outlawed? How can that happen in a country? You know why it happens? Because people are seeking God. They're seeking God. I think it's indicative in the United States of America. I think the reason you have an opioid crisis and a drug crisis and, and, and alcohol consumption and uh, the, 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 we're being, by the way, and, and, and understand, this is, this is something that it is not easy to do, but we're, we're becoming uh, addicted in this country to sports. I, I, and I'm a sports fan. I, liked, I grew up playing sports and following sports, but, but this, is, this is getting to be every single day of the week. And, and billions and billions of dollars. And people are worshiping it. They're living their life for it. It's just become a God. And, and the immorality and the pleasure and everything that Americans are going after, it's, it's their heart crying out for something to fill the void that's in their life. But none of those things satisfy it. Only Jesus Christ can satisfy that longing. You see, knowing God, Cornelius found out that knowing about God and knowing God are two different things. It's interesting. Cornelius prays. And God heard his prayer. Say, well, God never hears the prayer of a lost man. Well, you better tell God that. He just heard his prayer. He heard him asking God for asking God to, for guidance. Hudson Taylor, when he was in China, an elderly Chinese man said to him, "Are you a foreigner?" And Taylor said, "Yes, I'm an Englishman." And he asked, are those books in, the ba- in that bag on the table? He said, yes, they are books. He said, are you a teacher of a foreign religion? And Hudson Taylor said, yes, I'm a teacher of the Jesus religion. And the Chinese man then told Taylor that for many years he'd been a seeker after the truth, but could find no religion that would take the burden of guilt from his soul. And a few nights before, he had a vision of a man in white who had told him to go into Hang Chow and there he would find a foreigner sitting in an inn with a bag of books on the table before him. He had visited the inn the day before, but found no such person. So finally he heard of this particular inn in the suburbs, and as a last hope he had entered it. And he met Hudson Taylor. And the missionary then preached the gospel to him, and gave him a New Testament to read. Two days later, Hudson Taylor said he visited him in his home, and found that all his idols had been destroyed, and he was rejoicing in Jesus Christ as his Savior. Seeking. Seeking. He left that man, Hudson Taylor said, adoring God, and not only for his power to save, but for his marvelous and miraculous way of leading souls to the messenger and the message of the gospel. You remember this morning in Sunday school, uh, we studied Rahab and how, how Rahab told them, that soon, listen, we, we heard of your God. We heard how He parted the Red Sea. We heard how He led you uh, in the wilderness. We heard what He did to Sihon and Og, those kings. And man, fear came upon us and our hearts did melt. Nobody had any courage to stand against you. Oh, if Israel would have just known, if those spies, when they spied out the land, if they'd have just known, hey, let's go take it. Those people are afraid of us. Don't care how big they are. They're, they're, they have no courage to stand against us. You understand? God prepares people who are seeking. You just have to ask. Bring it up. Say something to them. That's where we find out that not only is the man seeking, and we see that with Cornelius, but now God has to send the messenger. And the messenger has to be submissive. Notice, beginning in verse number 9, On the morrow, 
as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry. And he would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. There came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. <coughs> and the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice. Seems like Peter always had to have it three times, you know what I mean? <laughs> Seemed to be his number, didn't it? And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted it himself, what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there, were lodged there. When Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And he said, Cornelius is during a just man, one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nations of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. And he called them in and he lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanying them. So now we see the messenger has to be made submissive. Peter's in Joppa. He's in the home of Simon a Tanner and he goes up to pray on the rooftop. That was the private place. That was a secluded place and a place where they could be alone and they could spend time in prayer to God and meditation. And God gives him a vision that day. A great sheet with all kinds of animals let down. You remember Peter being a Jew is, is not going to take of unclean animals. Jews had some very strict dietary requirements from the Old Testament. And so he's saying, uh, Peter, you, you kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord. He's still, still wanting to tell the Lord no. Do, do you remember? You never get in trouble when you say yes to God. You know when you get in trouble? When you say no. Remember Dr. Henniger saying that in a, in a sermon? I never forgot that as a teenager. You'll never be in trouble by saying yes to God. Always say yes to God. Peter said no, and, and then Lord said, Hey, what, <clears throat> what, what I call clean, don't you call unclean. And what I say you can eat, don't you say you cannot eat. And so, he's, and he does it three times, and of course, the, he, what he doesn't know is, he's the answer to somebody's prayer is the answer to Cornelius' prayer. And you don't know. Listen, Cornelius is simply praying to God. He's simply seeking God. He's trying to do what he knows to do to find God. What is God's answer to Cornelius' prayer? His answer is to send him a messenger. He's sending him a preacher to tell him the Gospel. And every one of us has born again believers are preachers of the gospel. In this case, there's even women preachers. Okay? Not women pastors, but women preachers. You're proclaiming the gospel, giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. A Sunday school teacher told her pupils the story of Peter that he would be a fisher of men. And then she's asking questions after the lesson, lesson and she says, well, who catches men nowadays? And one child quickly answered, policemen. <laughs> and the teacher then explained the difference between soul winners and policemen. She said, policemen catch men to bring them before the judge. Soul winners catch men to bring them before the Savior. And uh, that's the difference. The Bible says that, uh, in fact, look at Romans, Romans 10. Hold your finger in Acts 10. We're going to come back there. Look at, with me at Romans 10. Familiar verses to us. We're used to using Romans 10 and verse 13. If you're, 
giving the plan of salvation and you're leading someone to faith in Jesus Christ, you're used to bringing them to 10.13 and saying, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that's the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. But notice verse 14. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That's us. How are they going to hear without a preacher? How sad will it be to... That how sad would it be if, if you were one of those people in those 7,000 unreached people groups that have not heard the name of Christ? I don't know that there's anybody in the world, no matter how remote they are, that hasn't heard the name Coca-Cola. And they've never heard the name of Jesus. Shame on us. Shame on us. You see, God always raises up a messenger. The eunuch in Acts chapter 8 is reading the gospel, or the, the, the prophet Isaiah as he's returning from Jerusalem. And he's reading Isaiah 53. But he doesn't understand who he's reading about. How does God explain that to him? He sends a messenger. He sends the... Philip to go near the chariot and say, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I except some man guide me? How easy was it for Philip to lead that man to Christ? It wasn't hard at all. He was wondering who Isaiah is speaking of. And he preached unto him Jesus. You see, he always raises up a messenger. When God, when God Himself knew that the woman would be going to the well in John chapter 4, Jesus tells His disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. They didn't understand that because you didn't go through Samaria, you went around Samaria. You don't want any dealings with the Samaritans. You wanted to stay away from them. And Jesus said, no, I have to go through here. Why did He have to go through there? Because there's going to be a woman coming to this well who needs to hear about Christ. Jesus wins that woman to Himself that day. And then many others from the city come out and they receive Christ as well. You see, it's our responsibility to be the messengers who surrender to go. You've heard me say before, all the other times that when it's Jesus' birth or whether it was His uh, time in the garden or His suffering on the cross and His resurrection and His ascension, it was always angels that gave the announcement. And I'm sure when it came time for God to say, now we've got to spread the word that, that Jesus has died for their sins, that He's risen, that He's ascended back to heaven, that He's able to save all those that come unto God by Him. I think the angels, Gabriel and Michael, they're standing by saying, okay, give us the word. We'll organize the angels. We'll go announce it. And God said, no, you stand down, angels. I'm going to let those people do it. And I wonder how many angels hung their head and said, you've got to be kidding me. Those, those people, they'll do it. And sadly, we're proving them to be right. Because we are not surrendered to carry the message. Carry the message. How committed are we? What has become more important to us than getting the gospel to the ends of the earth? Jimmy Carter, which has gone, has, has gone way, way to the left politically. Most of you know, we remember him from the 70s. And even before that, when he was in Georgia in the 60s, knows that he was a Sunday school teacher in Plains Baptist Church, Southern Baptist congregation in Georgia. And... In his autobiography that was called Why Not the Best, he shared an incident that made him very aware of his lack of what he called evangelistic fervor. 
Um, uh, which was usual for, some, for many Southern Baptist churches, still is, that they have a week of revival in the spring and a week of revival in the fall. And that's basically their evangelistic thrust for the entire year. They only held a one-week revival. And in preparation for that week, the leaders of the congregation would go into the community inviting non-churched members to the services. Carter was a deacon, and he said, I always participated in that exercise. He said, I would visit a few homes, read Scripture, and have prayer, and share some religious beliefs, and then I'd talk about the weather, the crops, and I'd leave. He said, I was always proud of my effort to retain a clear conscience throughout the rest of the year that I had done my witnessing. But one day, he said, I was asked to speak at a church in Preston, Georgia, And the topic they asked him to preach on was Christian witnessing. So he sat in his study writing the message. He decided he would make a great impression upon these people by telling them how many homes he'd visited through the years for this revival campaign. He said he figured it was 14 years since he had returned from the Navy. And he added it up. He thought he had conducted 140 visits. And he proudly wrote that number in his message. But then he began to reflect on the 1966 governor's election in Georgia. As he campaigned for the state's highest office, he spent 16 to 18 hours a day trying to reach as many voters as possible. At the conclusion of his campaign, he calculated that he had met more than 300,000 Georgians. And he said, sitting in the study, the truth became evident. He said, quote, the comparison struck me. 300,000 visits for myself in three months and 140 visits for God in 14 years. Hmm. Mr. Hines, the founder of the Hines ketchup, the 57 variety kind, was a Christian. At a revival meeting one day, the minister turned to him and said, you're a Christian man, why aren't you up and at it? He went home angry. And he went to bed, but he couldn't sleep. He said at 4 o'clock in the morning, I got up, prayed to God that He would make me a power in His work. And I went to sleep. He attended a meeting of bank presidents the next morning and shortly afterward, he turned to a man sitting next to him at that meeting and he spoke to him of Christ. And that man looked at him in amazement and said, I've wondered many times why you never spoke to me about it if you really believed in Christ. That man accepted Christ that day as his Savior. And it was the first of 267 souls that Mr. Heinz won to Christ after that time. Wouldn't it be sad if you went to witness to somebody and they said, well, I wondered when you were going to say something to me. I wondered why you never talked to me about Christ. I knew you were a Christian. People, you say, oh, pastor, people's hearts are hard. No, no, no. I think our hearts are hard. I don't think the hard hearts are on their side. I think it's on our side. We don't go and tell them if we're not submissive as messengers to take the truth of salvation. Are we any different than Jonah who refused to go? Basically, when he go to Nineveh, hey, you know what? Ninevites can go where the booger man lives. Jonah didn't care. In fact, when they repented, Jonah was still upset. Are we any different when we don't tell and we're not submissive as messengers to tell folks about Jesus Christ? Peter was submissive. The men came and he said, let's go. Let's go. Well, we see the man was seeking The messenger is submissive. Let's go back to Acts 10. All right? 
Acts 10. You okay? Keep your shoes on. We may not be finished yet. All right? Let's see what took place. Verse 24 says, On the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. He must have, he must have been reading Joshua about Rahab. Gather them all together. And he did. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter said, please kiss my big toe. No, he didn't say that, did he? No. He, he said, Peter took him saying, stand up, I myself am also a man. Peter was not the first pope. Okay? And he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how it is unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I ask therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting unto this hour. At the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are in, had remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call Simon, whose surname is Peter, for he lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto you. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, that thou hast well done, that thou art come. Now, therefore, we are all here present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation that he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, publishing peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say you, you know, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Verse 43, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, <coughs> the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should be not be baptized, which has received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days." So Peter gets there and he finds out. Now listen, the man is seeking, the messenger is submissive, and many are saved. Many are saved. Cornelius says, not only waited, he gathered together a crowd, his kinfolk and friends, and, and ready to listen to whatever Peter preached. And Peter preaches Jesus Christ to them. He preaches the, miss, the mission of Jesus and that He came and they hung Him on a tree and He was uh, 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 crucified for them and it's only through Him and believing in Him that they'll have remission of sin. And they believe. And they believe. And, and the Holy Ghost comes upon Him and He makes that evident as they speak in tongues. And by the way, don't, don't think that's unknown tongue. Don't think that's gibberish tongue. That's language. They spoke in another language and they spoke in a language. And by the way, do you remember in verse 1 what band Cornelius was a part of? The Italian band. And when he got excited and he got saved and these other people got saved, what, what language do you think they're going to speak? They're going to speak Italian. I, I, remember watching I Love Lucy? Now I'm getting down to your level, aren't I? Okay, there you go. All right. 
Yeah, and Ricky, Ricky get excited? What would he talk? Cuban, yeah. Yeah, he'd go after it. huh? And, and, and that's what they did, and they were astonished that they heard these folks talking just like they were able to talk in different languages on the day of Pentecost. They said, all right, now they've received the Holy Ghost, they've accepted Christ, they ought to be baptized. Let's not forbid them, let's get baptized. That's always the order. You believe, you baptize, and then you belong. Believe, baptize, and belong to the local church. And, and begin to serve God. The desire to be with the people of God. And by the way, they, they, they prayed them. Do you see the last sentence? Then prayed they Him to tarry certain days. Isn't that amazing? They're, they're saved and now you know what they want? They want Him to stay. They want to hear more. They want to be desirous of more. They want to hear more of the things of God. That's a good indication that they really, truly have met Christ as their Savior. If you go, if you're a submitted messenger, God will have people there to be saved. When Paul got the Macedonian call, he went into Macedonia, and remember there's a man saying, come over and help us. He got there, he couldn't even find any men. You don't know what, what's going on. They said, well, there's some women down by the water, there by the river, they're, they're, they're meeting. He went down there, and there was a woman there named Lydia. The Bible says, whose heart the Lord opened. Well, how'd that happen? Because there was a submissive messenger that went. Lydia got saved and her household got saved. She got baptized. And she desired that, that they, they stay and talk with her and teach her. Well, they got word got out and remember they got arrested and they got put in stocks and they got put in prison. But that night as they sang praises to God and prayed, an earthquake came and the jailer came in. He was going to take his life. But they said, don't do yourself any harm. And he brought them out. Remember, he asked the great question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they taught him the word of the Lord and all that were in his house. And the jailer and Mrs. Jailer and all the little jailers got saved. The whole family got saved. They got baptized in the wee hours of the morning. You see, if you go, God has people that you will reach. God has people that will receive Christ if you just tell them. The best form of advertising ever invented and the one that's still the most successful is word of mouth. The word of mouth. I did not know that that originated with an automobile an automobile maker named, who, who invented a car named the Packard. How many remember the Packard? Okay, you've heard of it. How many ever known one and seen one? Yeah, that dwindled it down, okay. Was that your first car, Brother John? Or first car, Packard? Okay, good. Right after the Model T, was it? That's all right, amen. <laughs> he was the last, Packard was the last auto manufacturer to get into advertising. And it didn't happen until old man Packard died. The reason, because whenever he was approached by an advertiser to advertise his car, he would always say, I don't need any. Just ask the man who owns one. And when he died, that became their advertising slogan that was used, ask the man who owns one. That was the Packard slogan. I think that's what we're supposed to do. How do I know I can have eternal life? Well, ask somebody who has it. How can I know Jesus is my Savior? Ask somebody who knows Him. How can I be certain I'm on my way to heaven? Hey, ask somebody who's going, who's certain about it. That's you and me. The Lord said, Pray ye therefore the Lord will send forth laborers in this harvest. God's sending. Are we answering? Are we going? I pray God will help us to reach the unreached around us. And then to reach the unreached of this world for Jesus Christ. 
many are seeking. The messengers must be submissive. When that happens, many will be saved. Just like it happened in Acts chapter 10. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, I pray you'll take the truth tonight. Lord, thank you for including Acts 10 in the Bible. We gleaned some things tonight from Peter. Being submissive, we gleaned some things from Cornelius seeking. And thank you, Lord, that you included the conversion of many there. Not just Cornelius, but friends and kinsmen and others. Lord, help us to keep the main thing the main thing. I pray that You'd impress on each of our hearts tonight that there's people out there whom You have crossed our path every single week. That You have designed to be there for us to speak to about Jesus Christ. Forgive us for letting those opportunities pass by. Help us to be submissive messengers. Help us to spread the word by word of mouth. That those of us who possess Christ will tell others of Christ. Those of us who have eternal life will tell others how they can have eternal life. Those of us who have sins forgiven would tell someone else how they can have their sins forgiven. Help us, Lord, to reach those who are unreached, yet seeking to know You. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. wonder how many folks tonight would say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart tonight. I want to be a submissive messenger carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to be sensitive and I want God to use me to reach people for Jesus Christ. Pray for me, Pastor. God's spoken to my heart. Will you slip your hand up tonight? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. You may put them down. Everybody ought to be a submissive messenger for Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. Hear our prayer now, Lord, as we take a moment and bow the knee to you and say, Lord, help us to be bold in our witness for Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit of God that indwells us as believers, Make us aware of the divine appointments you have for us. And I pray that you'll give us the boldness to give the gospel to people whom cross our path. I pray, Lord, that we would hear testimonies from people in this room to say, I was a submissive messenger and many were saved. I had a Cornelius this week. And I spoke to them and they said, I've been looking for someone to tell me about this. Give us some testimonies like that, Lord, in the lives of people that are here in this room. And we'll thank you for it. Now, help each of us to do what you're telling us to do in our heart.